Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Data Diversity. We would like to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will be joining, or today Donna will be talking about data governance aligning technical and business approaches. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag DA Strategies. And if you'd like to chat with, with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just note that Zoom chief, the Zoom chat I can talk today defaults to just the panelists, but you may switch that to chat with everyone in the webinar to network with each other. And to access the Q&A or the chat panel, you'll find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years experience helping organize organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello, thank you. Always a pleasure to do these data diversity webinars. Um, and um, on that note, uh, if you have not come to these webinars before and this is your first, um, this is a series that we hold every month. Uh, Dataversity is kind enough to record all of these and store these for perpetuity on their website. Uh, so if any of the previous topics of, uh, that we did early in the year are of interest to you, uh, you can certainly catch them as a recording. Um, also, uh, we hope you can join us next month where we talk about data architecture for digital transformation. Um, and then there's another rich lineup for next year in 2022. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's talk about what we wanted to cover today. As Shannon mentioned, um, kind of the, talking about that dichotomy, I guess, um, of data governance um, between kind of that business approach, which um, you know can consist of meetings and, and stewardship and, and kind of organizational change, as well as some of the technical data management. And I always find it interesting when you're talking to someone and they mention governance, I've learned to kind of really clarify well, what, what do you what do you mean? What are you talking about? And both are probably right. That that great and condition. Uh, you know, everything is not everything is either or. Um, but uh, some people think of it as the technical data governance. It could be data models. It could be metadata. It could be uh, technical processes. It could be change management, um, et cetera, et cetera. Other people, even that word change management, um, a lot of folks think right away, kind of software change management or data. Um, you know, model change management. Others focus, think of organizational change management and, and how do we get the people uh, really around uh, any change in the organization like data governance um, and how do we get the right stewardship roles from the business and how do we get, you know, the committee structure and the org structure. Both are super critical um, and both of them are kind of the glue that hold things together. Um, I always think that, you know, the data governance lead and the data architect um, should be fast friends because they both kind of see two sides of that same coin. So I kind of wanted to walk through that um, that hopefully some, um, you know, uh, practical tips to kind of, you know, talk a little bit more about that, those different aspects and how you can put them together. So if you've come to my webinars before, this, this framework should look familiar to you. Uh, we use it a lot in our practice to really summarize our approach to data strategy, which is why, as our name suggests, what we do a lot of, and governance is always a key part of that. And, and where we put that um, is between business strategy and what the organization is really trying to achieve in the organization through data, it's sort of as that wedge between that and then the technical aspect of data management um, or analytics. So, you know, the databases and the, you know, metadata management, uh, both are valid, but really I think that the people part, the culture, the process, um, is that that glue that holds those two together and we often get questions why do you have governance and collaboration on the same line to me those seem like opposites um and i say probably on the contrary um i find and maybe i'm naive well probably am um but i you know i don't think i've met anyone in their when and all the clients i've worked with in their career that come to the work on purpose and say i want to have bad data or I want to hide data from other people, or you know, et cetera, et cetera. People are just trying to get their job done, and the more they don't see the value of the data they put in because they don't see where it goes downstream. So the more people understand, have a common 
you know, principles and, and common goals around data, I think the rest of that comes um, fairly easily because uh, people generally are just trying to, again, trying to get their job done. And the more they see that data is part of that job, that's where that collaboration comes in. Um, so more about data governance. So data diversity um, and I, I work together just every year uh, on a, a survey on data governance trends. And I always find it interesting. Um, and I always find it not surprising that in terms of some of the big drivers of um, data or, or the priorities of organizations around data is data governance. Um, and you'll see some of the, stat, uh, the stats there, over 76% already. Um, have a data governance in place or, or, or are planning one. 86% um, consider data security, which is kind of the little brother of, of uh, data governance in a way. Um, and then uh, I found this one interesting. Over half um, identified themselves that collaboration was a big part of using a defined data architecture. And as I mentioned, I think architecture is kind of the left hand or right hand or whatever you want to say of data governance. They really fit together. Um, so not surprised by those findings. Um, I probably would have thought, oh, in my experience, um, it's higher than 50% um, around that collaboration through a defined data architecture. But I think there's some methods that can help that um, work even better. So um, what is data governance? I'm a data architect, data modeler, so I always like my definitions. Um, and I took this from the DEMA DMBOC or the Data Management Body of Knowledge. Um, and I like this definition because I think it really gets to some of the nuance that data governance is that exercise of authority, control, and shared decision-making. And to me, that's kind of that why do you have collaboration in the definition of governance, that shared decision-making. To me, that's kind of the yin and the yang, um, the carrot and the stick, right? So if you think of yin and yang, almost two opposites of one being very um, you know, rigid and, and, and the other one being more flexible. Um, similar with with governance you can't only be the stick um you're gonna lose interest um you really have to in all cases have that carrot to really make people interested even if you do have a big stick and you have a regulation um uh, it's still people may do it reluctantly you really get a get a better result with carrot um but you can't be all carrot without any sort of policies or sticks so i do think it, it's a balance and, and you really need to look at both to make it successful um what is data governance? I'm sure I think this type of meme is maybe a little old now, but I still like it of, you know, what, what I do for a living, what my friends think I do, et cetera, what my mom thinks I do. So I thought I'd do one of those for data governance, right? So data governance, you know, might not, you know, everyone's heard the quote from Harvard Business Review that data science is the sexiest job of the 21st century. Unfortunately, I have not seen that yet for data governance being the sexiest job of the 21st century, uh, story of my life. Um, but so when you tell someone you're in data governance, you know, what do your friends say? I, I, okay, some nerdy data thing uh, up in your, your, you know, your office somewhere and we never see you. You just sit in your computer. Probably not too far from the truth, right? What my mom thinks I do or my dad, uh, well, data is kind of like a librarian and in governance, you're kind of telling people to do things all the time. Shush, be quiet, do the right thing, <laughs> put the books back. Um, again, maybe not the sexiest of, of stereotypes there. Uh, no offense to any librarians in the call. I think librarians are awesome. But um, again, not that what society thinks I do. Oh, data governance, that must be like data science because I've heard that's really sexy, but you're like one of those crazy data scientists that do crazy scientific experiments on data or something. I don't know, data, something. What my coworkers think I do. And this one be careful of. You're the people that are always telling us what to do. You're always yelling at us. You're always saying, I can't. No, no, yes, do this. Let's follow the standard, right? And, and although, I, again, back to that, carrot and stick, you do have to have some policies in place, but again, that you don't want to overdo it with the stick, that everyone's afraid of you or everyone hates you or they see you as onerous. That's probably not the reputation you want to have um, in the organization. Um, what I think I do, hey, I'm saving the world through data. I am the governator. <laughs> I didn't even know this existed. We actually had a client um, that wanted to name her head of data governance the governator because she thought that would be be a lot more exciting in the in the ad. Uh, she got knocked down. She still called the person the governor um, when they got the job. But yeah, I do think we often do feel like, hey, we're trying to save the world here. We're trying to save the organization. And sometimes we feel like the, the lone superhero, you know, fighting this battle on our own. Um, 
but probably the reality of all this, what I like to say, and I think is true, what you're actually doing is driving the success of the business. Most companies at some aspect are data-driven. If nothing else, finance department's data-driven, um, and they want to make sure that their numbers are right. But more and more companies are really realizing that at their core, they're a data company, or data can help them be a better whatever kind of company they are um, through better efficiency, quality, et cetera. Um, so the more you can align what you're doing in data governance with that success of the business, that's the biggest carrot you can get, right? When we're talking carrot and stick. And so I think it's important to remember that. And then you know, we won't dive into all of this in this presentation, um, but try to get more ROI and, and metrics around that to really prove to folks that, you know, yes, it does matter if you have the right product code on this product because we're selling it and we want to know how many we sold. We want to ship it to the right place um, and making some of those, you know, connections with either dollars and cents or, or lives saved or you know, whatever your, your organization is. I think that's really at the crux of what you try to do with governance to get that buy-in. Okay, so what is in, in terms of that need or establishing the why behind data governance? Because I would say more than half the battle is aligning with that why, getting everybody understanding why this is important if they don't already. Um, and then if, if they understand at a theoretical level that it's important, understanding that, no, we mean you, like you, you have to do things too. Um, so at it, its very core, if you think there's kind of two half sides of that coin of data governance, you're either reducing risk or, or defense um, or increasing opportunity offense. So I think with the reducing risk, probably not a lot of surprise there. Again, I think we probably overdo that sometimes with governance. Yes, there's a regulation. Yes, there's GDPR. Yes, there's, you know, PIPEDA or, um, you know, FERPA or HIPAA or, you know, name your regulation there, right? Um, and that even if without a regulation, there are certain actions or decisions that, you know, there's accountability for the information you're doing. We work with a restaurant chain and for them, you know, if we have the wrong recipe or ingredients on our menus and someone gets sick, you know, A, we're liable for, you know, the moral responsibility of someone's life or and or we get sued and or we end up in the newspaper, you know, so it isn't always a regulation for that, that risk aspect. Um, but what we don't, I think, think enough of um, with data governance is that increasing opportunity, that data is a strategic asset and we're going to be much more competitive in the organization if we have better data. I would say, in my experience, uh, having done this forever, um, I see this more and more now. I think you don't have to convince as much as we did in the, in the good old days um, that I think more organizations see that we want to be efficient and we want to be competitive and data helps us do that, whether it's product data, customer data, student data, you know, patient data, et cetera. And the idea of a data-driven organization, uh, if you've been on some of my past webinars, we talk about that a lot, kind of that business value of data. Um, that's, that's a no-brainer, <laughs> to use that phrase, um, to kind of connect the, the value of data with the value of the business when you're a data-driven business. Uh, some of the you know, other areas that are kind of aligned to this, that approving efficiency, kind of talked a lot about that one already, but um, not only does it help you run the business per se more efficiently, but just the data management function is a lot more efficient. I mean, the number of times we come in and do a data strategy or an assessment, and, and, and maybe the data quality is great for the organization, um, but some poor person <laughs> spends weeks every month fixing it. Or every time we have to do the financial reports for management, it takes us, you know, five days out of a month to get that done. That's not efficient. So, you know, e even the, the company itself can be more efficient, but the data center roles can be more efficient. And this idea of driving collaboration and accountability, we use those words a lot. Um, so maybe because I'm sorry, but data governance isn't always the sexiest phrase. It is becoming more sexy. Um, but the idea of, hey, can we collaborate around data or can we be held accountable for data? You know, if you if you lost uh, some money, uh, you'd be held accountable for the organization. If you lost some product or shipped it and it got damaged, you're accountable. So really having that same, if data is an asset, you are accountable to the same, you know, uh, you know what do you call it? <laughs> the same level of accountability. Um, I've joked a lot already that data isn't sexy, but uh, data governance isn't sexy, but actually it is becoming, it's funny, you know, there's all these buzzwords in the industry, big data and data science and all of that. I, I mentioned data governance um, at, at one, one company and one of the younger, younger kids, I'll say, he's like, yeah, I know you love to throw those sexy buzzwords around like governance and everything, but we, I said, oh, wow, that now things have changed. <laughs> I didn't know we were the cool kids, um, but we really are. And I think, you know, we get a lot of our, projects come in are really driven by things like data governance and, and data quality. So um, on this note of offense and defense, 
It's good to think of when you're designing your data governance organization and or selling data governance, which you will always have to do continually over time or do an organizational change management effort of what is the driver for governance and getting this wrong can really have a negative effect. Um, and so, you know, if, if you're, you're a startup and you're all about profitability and growth and revenue and competitive advantage and you are the one that come in the room and say, whoa, 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 let's just wait a minute, you know, there's GDPR and let's get all our metadata in order. You, know, you might be right, uh, but the tone of that, you're kind of the downer in the room and they're going to stop inviting you to the meetings, right? By the same token, um, and you can probably tell by the way I talk, I tend to be more of an offense opportunity driven kind of person. And I've made the mistake of going into a very risk focused insurance company that maybe just had an audit um, and they are all about compliance and regulation and avoiding audit. Um, and I talk about all the sexy things you can do with data and the offense, you know, you don't want to do go that far either. Or, you know, you're talking about patient or student data and you try to talk about, I think I made this mistake too. <laughs> Not that I ever make mistakes. And you talk about data monetization, you know, and it sounds like you're going to be selling patient data or selling student data. Um, you don't want to be doing that as well. So, you know, read the room, read the company um, and, and kind of think, you know, on the spectrum in my company, are we more driven by the offense and the opportunity and or more driven by the defense? And, and probably you're somewhere in the middle. That's what that purple in the middle is. You know, you're, you're probably not fully red or, or fully blue, um, probably some purple, you know, even if you are very compliance focused, you know, company, actually we worked with one of these. It was a very compliant focused company. They literally had been in the paper and they literally had had a huge fine. But the way we stole, we sold data governance was through opportunity and how they could have better customer satisfaction and all that while they did the compliance and regulation. So we kind of put a little icing on the otherwise not, not pleasant um, opportunity. Okay, so I, I talked in the beginning about, you know, you can say the word data governance and people can have vastly different things. One could be talking about, again, metadata lineage, and the other person could be talking about, you know, committee meetings. Um, the good news of that is there's something for everyone in this, right, or, or something for everyone to hate. It kind of depends. So if you are the, uh, I often get the question in my consulting is, you know, who should be leading data governance? Who should be that data governance lead? And I fairly strongly say that that's a, a business-centric person, someone that can, you know, knows enough about technology um, that they can be aligned with it but it's not a tech person. It should be someone from the business or even project management or something um, that loves working with people that can be an evangelist, that can read the room and understand motivations and why people would want to comply or not comply or uh, et cetera. Um, there's another side of data governance that really does get excited about metadata lineage and the standards and, and, and aligning data types. You know, Sometimes you can get that perfect person who does both, um, but there's probably a spectrum um, and they both are necessary and both of those um, need to work together. I often see that as the head of data governance and the head of data architecture or the, the data architect, and they should really work closely together um, and augment each other. Um, but probably important to remember, um, because you probably are doing part of this in your job as well. Okay, when we look at uh, data governance, we like to apply a standard framework. Uh, this is ours. Um, as I kind of have been talking about already, you know, key to that is getting that vision and strategy for the organization, and then how you can align with that strategic vision through data. You know, why is this important to people? Um, you know, is it to improve revenue? Is it to reduce risk? Is it to et cetera, et cetera? Um, and, the, and that the foundation of that is the culture and communication. I, I, I would almost say that a, a good data governance um, rollout plan is akin to, if not aligned with, an organizational change management program. Um, and if you're not doing that, or, or perhaps even your marketing program, um, but more and more companies we work with that are really trying to do a data transformation or, or have a big data governance program, often work with a change management group or use some principles of, of change management, um, ADCAR or some of the other methodologies around change management that really help drive behavior and change in the organization. And then, so if, if the vision and is, is the kind of guiding light and the culture and communication is kind of the foundation to make that happen, kind of the, the pillars of that or the sandwich in between are the organization of people. What are the roles? How do you organize them? Is it a top-down hierarchy? Is it federated? Uh, we'll talk more about that. What are the processes and workflows? And I think there's two sides of that. What one would be, uh, what are the data governance processes? You know, how do you log an issue? How do you do chain data quality remediation, et cetera? 
But some of it is how do we align with business process, especially if you're doing something like master data management. I, would, I say that's almost 60% business process and how you align the business processes to have people even enter the data correctly from the get-go. Uh, data management measures, again, th this is almost um, that flip side of the, the one I showed here, right? If on the left is the people and on the right is the tech, I shouldn't have made the tech the devil. <laughs> no offense, I'm probably the person on the right, so no offense there. Um, th this is sort of mirroring that, right? The right is more, gets more technical as you go. So it could be data models, it could be metadata, it could be lineage, uh, et cetera. Um, and then the tools and platforms that could be, oh gosh, there are tools that sell themselves as data governance tools. It could be a data model. It, it could be a change management tool. It could be a process model. Um, you know, I, I, I often say, please look at that last and we'll talk more about that. A number of people who come to me and they say, I'm doing data governance, what tool should I buy? And I say, that's the wrong question. You may need a tool, but please don't start there. I had one client and one of my favorite clients, we really got along, we, we still keep in touch. It was years ago. Um, and he came to me and he said, I wanna buy tool X. I'm like, well, name the tool, I don't do that. Don't make me ask. Um, so, and I said, you know, Mike, you don't want to buy that tool and you shouldn't start there. He's like, but I, I want to buy tool X. And we did a whole like, data strategy and data. And like eight months later, he comes back. He's like, can I buy tool X now? I'm like, you, you didn't just say that. He said it with a twinkle in his eye. So I think he knew uh, he was wrong. But I still think as soon as I left the room, he'd want to go buy that tool. That's not the way to look at it. There are tools could be helpful, but don't drive it um, from the tool. Uh, the vendors will kind of push you in that direction. And I, I used to be a vendor, so I can tease them as well. Um, but be careful. It's... It, there are some helpful tools. You may not need a tool. Your tool might be PowerPoint, right, to help sell this. Um, but there are some of the excellent tools in the market might be the wrong tool for you in your use case. You know, do you need to have a tool that helps with workflow, or is it more metadata management? And and I've seen a lot of companies that we've worked with that buy a really fancy tool, and it just doesn't work for them. And again, it's not the tool. It's just they didn't they didn't think through this whole framework before they looked at what tools they might want to need. Um, okay, where well, I'm, I'm going to read through every row and column of this in great detail. I'm kidding, uh, but I, I thought this might be helpful. Of what types of things am, are we talking about in each one of these, you know, aspects of this framework? That might be a good reference if you download the slides later. You know, what do I mean by organization of people? You know, who not only are in your data governance committee, but maybe who's the stakeholders we need to work with, either inside or outside the organization. Um, that could be partners or regulators, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll kind of leave this for you to read through, um, kind of maybe can jog some ideas, maybe areas you hadn't thought of in your framework. Um, you know, we do a lot of data governance frameworks and implementations, and it's probably half and half of people who haven't done one and are starting fresh, or people who have started one, and it just isn't singing like they want it to. Um, so, you know, what can we tweak that maybe we hadn't thought of? Is it our committee structure's wrong? We have the wrong people in the committee. We're doing too many committees and not enough action. Like, what, what is it? Um, so maybe some of these questions might help you jog for some ideas for your data governance. So in terms of the who, uh, the people is a huge part of governance, no matter how you slice it. Um, and so when you think of, of who drives data management, in an organization, this is from one of the data management surveys we, uh, I did with data diversity. Um, you'll see that probably not surprisingly, there's the roles like IT manager, chief information officer, data architect. Um, but what I find interesting is more and more as we do the study, it's either the data governance lead or a chief data officer or business stakeholders um, that are involved in or actually running the data management program. So that, that's a good and bad to have the, if you say the business stakeholders are running it, they, sh they should be, they should be driving it, but they probably shouldn't be building your analytics platform, right? So where do those roles fit? Um, and, and IT should be driving it, but they shouldn't be driving it in a vacuum without understanding the business needs, et cetera. So how do you get that right balance? And how do you set up, again, the org structure around governance to manage that? So um, one, one area of, of, Data governance is data stewardship. I'm using data stewardship in a more general term. There are often a role called a data steward. There's also other roles like a data owner, or a data executive champion, the technical data steward. People get more and more creative data custodians, data, I don't know, I've heard a million things, right? Whatever makes sense for your organization. But data stewardship in general is just you kind know, of the business people who don't have data in their 
day job title, but are, are responsible for the quality and the accountability of that data and how it's used. I often find, so we, we often, we come in and do a assessment or, or something, we, we talk to a bunch of people, we do a bunch of interviews, um, which I think is sometimes a luxury that maybe working in an organization, you might not have, um, but I would say maybe don't think that. Um, I, I've had some, uh, I know some people who have had very successful data governance and then they've worked in the company and they, they do that. They do kind of a listening session and they go around the org and they, they ask people's opinions on what's working, what isn't. And you're doing two things. One, you're finding, the challenges in the organization. We are often kind of finding these hidden heroes. Um, almost every engagement we've done, there's there's someone in the org that we bring up later to management and say, you know, Mary would be a great, you know, steward. Like, Mary, like, did you know that she had the spreadsheet that's basically your vendor master data that no one's ever paying attention to? Really? I mean, she'd be a great advocate. Um, and there's always someone like that or many people like that that no one's ever really asked <laughs> or or they, they want to be involved and maybe they've been vocal, but they don't know how or they don't have the structure around it. So I, I'm fairly confident you will be pleasantly surprised that there's more people than you think um, that are probably on your side and are maybe they just don't know how to verbalize it or don't know what that role is, but they know they're having problems with data. Some people have been you know creative and trying to solve it themselves. But the more you can you know create a framework around that so people are you know paddling in the right direction together, um, that that can be really rewarding, not just to you, but to everyone else who's involved. Like a lot of people are very relieved to finally be a data steward because they can fix the thing, things they're working with. We we worked with a big financial institution last year. And one woman said, this is my dream that I am finally, before I retire, able to fix the things that have been driving me crazy for 25 years. And maybe that was a little extreme, but she was thrilled to be a data steward. And that was almost her career goal is to finally fix this stuff. Um, so yeah, listen to people. You may, you may find some hidden friends. Um, in terms of roles, um, you know, the data management body of knowledge, the MBOC is a good, a good guide. We, we pay a lot of attention, though. Are these the right roles? Um, you know, how many levels of roles and what the names of those roles should be? Um, but in general, the, these types of roles generally often exist. So generally, you should have some sort of executive sponsor that should be a non, I, I wouldn't say it's your you know, head of IT. It should be your head of marketing, your head of finance, or someone, or the CEO, whoever you can get on the executive team that, that really is a champion for data and is going to help drive this from the top down. Uh, generally, there's some sort of business data owner who uh, they are re representing the data for their area or their process, or again, I could do a whole webinar on how you define these roles, but um, they're looking a little more, more big picture. Are there general business rules and policies around this data? You know, how do we manage it? Do we share it? What are the key KPIs or, or measures we want to track for the organization and that sort of thing? The business data steward is a similar role. They're a little bit more on the day to day. They might be defining the more detailed rules around the, the metrics or, or the data types or the, and you'll be surprised. You know, they, they might be there arguing. Uh, for hours over what the right data type is for a value or, you know, the detailed calculations of a KPI or, or something. And, and they often work very closely with the business data owner, sometimes report to the business data owner, but are more the, you know, the hands on the feet on the street or hands in the pot or <laughs> the analogy is, but they're actually using it day to day and are probably a little more into the weeds. Uh, do think of that carefully. I've seen, I've seen that kind of go wrong on both sides. Either you have the business data owner doing way too detailed stuff. You know, hello, vice president of operations. Could you just go through this spreadsheet and make sure all the calculations are right for your, they really shouldn't be at that level and they'll you'll probably bore them and they're too busy and you're going to turn them off. At the same token, often you might be trying to get that bigger picture vision from the business data steward and, and they, they literally almost can't see it. They're, they're, they're so, not want to say stuck, but they're so involved in that day to day and in their process they just haven't had the opportunity or don't have that exposure to the bigger picture. Um, so it'll be great to tell you how that system works or how they do their job, um, which is what you need, but they probably can't see the, the full organization because that's not their role. So be careful about that. Um, and then there's a technical data steward often, and they either are the subject matter expert for a system, like they run the CRM or the you know point of sale system or something. I just be careful there. Some people associate those folks with a business data owner. We're, we're just going to, you know, manage the CRM and think, don't don't think about systems so much. You should be thinking at a business level, right? So these people are important, um, but they should be aligned with the business data owner and beta steward to support them. But they shouldn't necessarily be driving. Uh, they should be supporting. Okay, so 
about organization and change and capability. And I think this is another one to think very carefully about. And, and again, where we see things go wrong, this is often it. So um, look at your, the one on the left is more your organizational structure and capabilities and how your company runs. And the one on the right is how you might create and define a data governance organization if you have a standalone data governance organization. So the one on the right is almost your classic Dama Diembach type thing. Um, this is genericized, but um, you, know, you have some sort of executive leadership team with a sponsor. You would have a data governance steering committee with your data owners, maybe a data governance committee with your stewards, have working groups, et cetera. That, that can work really well. We often have structures like that. For some companies though, that just seems really hierarchical and really complicated and too much. So maybe you might have only one committee. Maybe you have no committees and just roles to start. Maybe you have a more federated approach. Maybe you integrate this with the agile life cycle. We had one company that actually integrated data governance as part of their product release. They were a retail company and every product stage of the product life cycle product, like the actual widget they were selling um, had a data component. Is the data right for the shipment? Is the data right for marketing, et cetera? So in a way that's the best data governance you can have because it's operational. It's actually literally part of people's day jobs. So give that a lot of thought that is often where it goes wrong. People come to a committee and they, they hate committees and that's, that's just not the culture. Or we don't have a committee and it's a very committee driven culture and we don't have the right people in the room to make the decisions, right? Neither, neither is right or wrong. It just has to fit um, your culture. There's a lot of great things about committees. Um, just has to fit the way you do it. As an example, um, this is, I, I, I use this one a lot because it's kind of ironic to me or interesting to me. Um, this was from a manufacturing company um, that we initially started with something like the one here where it's very hierarchical and committees. And they said, you know, we're not a hierarchical company. Um, I would have thought with manufacturing, it was just very X, Y, Z. And, and, you know, maybe a top down wouldn't, wouldn't be bad and having that structure would be good. Um, I've actually changed this a little bit because they said, you know, we want, I, I, not to be stereotypical, but these were all kind of guys, guys, kind of, it was a manufacturing, they had factory floors and all that, uh, big boots and, you know, <laughs> um, and they said, you know, we want more on the presentation concentric overlapping circles and pastel co colors, because uh, that's more soft. And we, we, we think ourselves as overlapping teams, not boxes and lines and hierarchical structure. And we're more agile and we're more fluid, um, which again, would not be the stereotype I would have had for, you know, a, a manufacturing for big heavy metal type things. Um, but that was their culture. And I, we listened because it wouldn't have worked to have that rigid structure. And the, it more came out like something on the left where they had a council and then each group kind of had their own uh, autonomous um, voice, but then they got together as more of a, you know, a federated collective. And, and then the actual action happened in their agile project teams. So that worked really well for them, um, but you had to really listen closely to the organization. So you wouldn't, it wouldn't have worked had we had a different structure. Um, and I would say, I, I just talked a lot about that, but um, it is important. And, and that's often where we see things go wrong. You're, you're just not fitting the culture of the company. So how do you find the right balance um, between <clears throat> kind of that business approach, the technical approach? And, and the other part is kind of being more proactive or reactive. And this might be a, a complicated slide, but I like it. Um, so if you read it, the one is, are, are we more proactive, which means resolve it at the source. I mean, if you think of data entry, if all data, data quality, if all data systems had drop down menus for the, you know, the states you can enter or the codes you can enter and, and, and had the right value check, your data quality would be great. And you wouldn't probably even think about it. Um, and other, so, you know, that would be kind of your resolving it at the source. Uh, resolving it after the fact is when you're doing data quality cleanup. Um, and that's what you probably don't want to do. So what can you do up front? And I, I have this both automated things at the bottom, like, well, can we have, you know, data quality validation at the source when you put data in? Can we have automated validation checks, um, et cetera? Can we have automated workflow uh, at the top in the business? Do we have business process change to really make sure data gets in right? Do we have the right policies, procedures? Do we have the right data governance that's even setting those right policies, right? So that's really kind of the thinking ahead. Um, you might not have that luxury. So you might be doing things in the, in the back that are kind of that reactive, we're cleaning up data quality or we're you know, doing transformations to make the reporting right, et cetera. And then I put that one in the middle, which is kind of somewhere in between. It, it could be you know, the data stewardship over time, auditing quality over time, um, 
And then there's one that might surprise you, the conscious disregard, right? Sometimes you actually, uh, Shannon and I were talking about that before the break of, we tend to be data quality people. And, you know, you could have a, a spreadsheet of, of data of, of your customers and it could be a hundred customers and you spend all day trying to get the data just perfect. You know, the person put their address as 101 main street. Should I, should I write the whole word street or, or just put ST or, you know, and it might not matter. We're just you know, I don't know, we're going to send Christmas cards to the middle, it'll get there, don't worry about it, right? So, or maybe this data, you know, we had one customer that outsourced some of their data quality, and, and, the, and the results came back and said, you know, your fax number fields are terrible, you know, half of them are empty. Well, who uses the fax anymore? I hope nobody, because I hate them. But um, that might be a great conscious disregard. Yep, fax number is empty, because we don't use fax number anymore. What, don't worry about it, move on. And so kind of that prioritization of what to worry about is super important as well. Okay, so uh, on my, my tool rant, um, there is no one size fits all data governance tool, no matter what the vendor says, they may have be a data governance tool, but there's many types of tools that do data governance. So this is trying to show, um, this is actually from one engagement, we several engagements we've used this kind of pattern. Um, this is one example, you don't have to do it this way, but one would be like, what, what are the functionalities you're looking for? We're trying to do processes and workflow. Is that a technical need? Is that a, how important that is to the business? Um, and then kind of look at your tool so you can do different visualizations. You know, for the one on the right, their most important thing was glossary and metadata management. You know, security wasn't important. Lineage wasn't as important to them. Um, so they, they could, you know, maybe even have a SharePoint list of glossary terms for them. Maybe that's enough. Maybe your ranking would have been very different. You know, it's actually about security and privacy and the lineage of PII across the organization. And maybe you, you really need a detailed tool to do that. You could say, hey, we, we want a tool that helps show the roles and responsibilities and, and workflows for approval. That might be another tool. So again, all of, you could, it might not be, a, it could be a data modeling tool. It could be a master data management tool. It could be all of the above, right? So I think the best way is to start at what, what functionality do we need? And then do we even need a tool for it? You know, it could be I'm creating a data governance organization. I can do that in PowerPoint. Yeah, I guess that's a tool, but you know, I probably don't need to go purchase something. Um, so just give that some thought. Um, I do think data architecture does have a massive um, part of, of data governance. One thing we often do, and often get questions until people see it and then it just works really well, is to have kind of pilots or proofs of concept or, or whatever, but around architecture and governance. And that often surprises people because often a POC or a quick win is, oh, just put together some crappy piece of software that really shouldn't go to production, but then we are, are gonna put it in production and then we'll complain three years from now when it's not working and the data quality is terrible and it doesn't meet our needs, right? It's just often fast means, you know, do it badly and slap it together. But um, we've had a lot of success with, do an architecture POC. J just pick a business problem that needs to be solved, do a small data model for it. It could be five entities or, you know, whatever to really understand uh, this one, I think an insurance company looks like, right? So that, you know, I, I have a customer it makes a claim. I, I have a, a policy that's linked to the customer, not the broker, or even something very simple like that can actually often unleash really interesting business rules and root cause analysis. Do a process model. How does data get into the system and who touches it along the way? A good old fashioned CRUD matrix of where data is created, read, updated, and deleted. I can go a long way in really highlighting a problem. Can you do an architecture diagram um, around the systems that are involved in this? What are the business rules? What are the policies? What's the put a glossary together? Is there, let's do some data quality profiling, right? So kind of pick all of the things you should do in a, in a data governance initiative, get your data stewards, get your data owners together and just do it with a particular question. You know, how are we gonna support our brokers for, with data? How are we gonna support our customers? How do we price our policies? You know, we're trying to price our policies, but we can't get credit rating and that's gonna be a problem. How do we, you know, anonymize credit rating so we can, you know, rate on it, et cetera, et cetera. But pick that problem. And then again, sometimes you might have problems getting your data stewards to get excited about it and, until they do it. And so I often kind of learn by doing or, or, or sneak it in. It's like, I don't know, putting chocolate on something so your kid will eat it, right? It's, it's you know, don't worry about it. This is just a quick, you know, thing we want you to do. And then you turn around and say, wasn't that helpful? Wasn't that great? And they agree. And you say, that's data governance. Oh, Oh, if that's what you wanted me to do, I'll, I'll do that again. Just don't make me do that data governance thing, right? Because they, they have visions of big, boring committees and things like that. But once you 
actually do it and they see the value and, and see that really it's stuff they already know in their heads. They're just getting the right people in the room to solve it. You, you'll get the buy-in and you're starting to do the right thing along the way. If you do a lot of these, gee, by the end of it, we have an enterprise data model. Um, we have documented process models for the org. But if you went to management perhaps and said, can we have you know, a year and a half to document all our business processes to improve data quality? Yeah, I bet you'd have trouble getting funding, right? But if you say a series of, hey, we wanna clean up uh, customer data so we can sell more policies, just give us three months, sure. And then you keep doing that and showing the value. Then maybe you ask for the big chunk, um, but often you can kind of do it by stealth through these small targeted projects that are still doing it the right way. Um, okay, so it's a little bit more into some of these tools. I'm a huge fan, uh, nerdy fan of data governance um, and metadata management. Um, and metadata is often, I like to say, that's the kind of the actionable aspect of your policies and procedures. You can say that we need to, anon you know, we can't share PII or we need to have certain formats or we need to do whatever. It's the metadata in the systems that actually allow you to do that and make it, you know, seamless and integrated to actually, you know, enforce these policies, something like GDPR. How do you, how do you know that where your customer data is? You really can't do that without metadata. So you can have a great policy say, you know, if someone asks for their data, you need to share it. Can't really do that without great metadata. Uh, there's a lot of tools on the market that support metadata. Uh, can do a whole webinar on just this one. So I'll try to keep it simple. Um, but just as some general categories, I know there's a lot of ways to man manage metadata. Kind of the biggest, biggest, baddest, if you have, you know, the need and you have the budget and uh, would be kind of some sort of metadata repository, catalog, data catalog is kind of a new sexy word. Um, and, and at its core, it is really almost a data warehouse for metadata, um, where you have a metadata storage, you have what they call meta models, it's almost like your data model for your meta, you know, what are you storing? Am I storing information about, you know, tables and columns and etc. Um, there's some sort of matching and reuse logic so that I know that a customer entity and my data modeling tool is the same one in the database and kind of linking that together. Generally some reporting, um, some sort of either a web portal or integration and in some way to integrate and get that data in, whether they call them scanners or interfaces or every vendor has their own thing, but some way to get it in and some way to get it out. So it's actually pretty simple, but there's a lot of complexity and actually we've done it at webinar earlier in the year on metadata catalogs, repositories, and how to choose one. Um, so there's a lot of nuance when you go to buy one, but at its simplest core, it has some components to look for of storing the data, getting the data from the different sources, rationalizing it, and then publishing it out to people. Okay, so again, if you have the need, I'm a huge fan of those. I used to build them and write them and sell them. So, you know, won't say anything bad about them, but I will also say you can often get away with a specific tool repository or functionality. Um, again, yes, I have I have written and sold and developed metadata repositories. And I will also say, you can probably get away with a SharePoint list for your business glossary to start without spending a whole, and both are true, depending on your use case, right? It may not end there, uh, but it might be a fine place to start. Um, a lot of the data modeling tools, when you think of it, a lot of your metadata is already in your data modeling tool, your entities, and if you've done it well, your, your definitions and some of your lineage and you know, more and more of the data modeling tools um, uh, are realizing that and are kind of putting a data catalog layer on top of their tools. Um, it could be a data dictionary. Some of the database vendors, again, are, are realizing this and putting a layer on their tool as a data dictionary. ETL, right? They, they, that's a lot of your lineage. Again, a lot of the vendors are putting a layer on top. So you can kind of see BI tools have their semantic layer. So you could, depending on your use case, if you really are just uh, all your metadata is in the data modeling tool. Um, maybe it's enough to do that. If you're really just more focused on the database development, maybe a layer on top of that is fine. And again, I'm a big fan of and and not or. Um, a lot of these tools can be integrated with the metadata catalogs. So you could start with a data modeling tool. And then as you expand to other sources, you might want to scan that in and have that in a bigger data catalog. Um, so that, that's important. I also don't want to diminish this idea of a metadata exchange or a registry or Again, when you're thinking of open data, if you're trying to share data with any other external party, um, you want to have that in some sort of documented either structure like JSON, XML, and or open data publication with you know, definitions of the terms and things like that. Um, so uh, some or all of those approaches can be really helpful. Uh, data models, I've talked a lot about, uh, big, big fan. Uh, you can either do it at the business level and or the technical level. Um, 
again, we have a whole webinar on this, but I would just say, be careful of, of knowing which level you're talking about, right? So if you're at the enterprise conceptual logical, a big part of that is the business rules. If you're at the logical slash physical, that's gonna be your technical data structures and your data types and your naming standards and things like that. All of those are super important to governance, right? So if you're trying to you know, develop correct reports, you need those conceptual and logical models to understand even what these ended, what is a customer? What, what is a policy? How do we define the rules? And at the physical level, you need to make sure all those standards are enforced and you have the lineage, et cetera. So it's a, and a lot of the tools out there, um, especially the more expensive ones can, can do all of those layers within the tool and you get the lineage between the tool as well. Um, process models, I talked a little bit about this before, but um, whether, again, whether you need a fancy tool or you're doing it on a whiteboard or a, a Visio, or I guess Visio is a tool, but a lighter tool. Um, but again, showing those swim lanes, showing the who, who's using the data, where is it touched, that this, I'm a, this can often highlight some of the best data governance and data quality issues because you're literally embedding it within your business process. You don't even think about it because when I developed a code name for the product, it therefore integrates with MDM and it's automated because we have those rules in there. And then you need less, the, remember that slide with the proactive and reactive. You need a whole lot less reactive when you've been proactive and it all just goes smoothly. I, I've worked with a handful of companies in my career that I actually love this when you sort of ask some of these questions of, you know, do you, do you have this problem with data quality? And, you, and they say, no, I mean, it just comes from the warehouse or no, we have a process. Really? There's people out there that <laughs> you guys don't realize how smoothly it runs, right? Like all of us, you don't realize you're not sick when you're not sick. Um, but it said, then when you get the cold, you realize how good you felt. Uh, so, but, but that's it. Unfortunately, with data governance, your reward is that you're sort of nothing happens and you're ignored and everything's boring. Everything just <laughs> running smoothly, uh, which is good. Uh, but you sometimes have to remind people that there's a lot of work to make it good. Okay. Um, I, I think kind of in a way, the new hip version of process models is the customer journey map. <laughs> Maybe that's jaded, but um, in a lot of ways, it is, it's looking at a, a process of sorts. It is the journey a customer takes along their process uh, to interact with you. And this can be another great way to do the customer journey map or work with marketing who has these customer journey maps and then do a data overlay. So what, what data are we collecting from the customer at each point in time? Or, or, or what data does that customer need to see at each point in time? And then who's governing that? Uh, one question I often get is, you know, how do you, Again, it could be a whole webinar, but you know, how do you organize data stewardship? Shouldn't we have like a customer data steward or a product data steward? I really push against that because here's a great example. Who owns customer data? Well, the marketing team and the sales team and the support team and the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you really need a cross-functional view. You might have a data architect who's looking just at customer, and you should, or master data management person just looking at customer. But really when you're creating the rules, you should look across that whole customer journey, student journey, patient journey, you know, whatever you're, you're developing. Um, good old fashioned CRUD matrix or a terrible name for a wonderful tool it could be DRUK or whoever comes up with a better name that we can use with those acronyms. Um, all power to you. I will use that word. Um, but what that does is take something like a, a customer journey or a process model and just be a lot more specific. You know, this particular piece of information, where is it created? That's often your owner. Uh, then where is it updated, deleted? You know, and you can often find a lot of issues here. Wow, it's created six times. We're working with a, a big uh, financial institution now, and we did one of these, and it was created six different times in different systems. Everyone thought they were creating it but that obviously leads to problems. So you know, a lot of something simple like this can really highlight a lot of these data governance in terms of who owns it um, and then process and, and data quality issues. Um, one quick story before I wrap it up, because I see that there's a lot of questions coming in or at least chats coming in. Um, this is, a, I think, one of our success stories that uh, did use that kind of uh, quick win data architecture and data governance by stealth, and it was super successful. So this was a, a big retail um, organization that uh, both manufactured, shipped, and sold the product. So they kind of had you know, vertical and horizontal coverage, and they had a lot of problems just even tracking their customers and tracking their products. Um, 
So you can imagine with customers, for example, uh, they would come into the store and they'd talk to a sales rep and you'd ask for, you know, what's your email? And they'd say, you know, go away at leavemealone.com or something like that. Um, then when they needed to have support later or, you know, get their product shipped, uh, they weren't getting notifications because they had a different email that, et cetera, that everything wasn't linked in. So very basic stuff, but also very impactful. So what we did there um, was pick one of those really small, we did, um, a data architecture, data governance sprint, where we built um, process models. We did data flow diagrams. We did data models. We did a system architecture diagram. Um, we created data stewards and a small data governance framework. And then we took, it was just a month. We did all of that. And we highlighted the problem of why there were duplicate emails, what it was affected. Um, and then we had all of the business people in the room. The result of that, two quotes I loved, um, one was the head of marketing where she said, you know, I never really feisty, brilliant woman, but not technical. And she said, you know, I never thought I'd use the word data flow diagram in my life, but she, I'm printing it and putting it on my wall um, because no one's ever explained why my marketing campaigns didn't work. Um, there was actually a, a kind of a, after this, they actually had all the things literally printed on the wall. And when everyone needed to change something, they would go to that wall <laughs> and look at it. Uh, the other one I love was the head of sales who actually said, huh, I never understood where that data went. Shouldn't I govern my team to actually use the word govern to maybe put in the right email and are there guardrails we could use? Again, never thought that the head of sales would say, please, could I have some better data governance for my team? Um, but he saw the result. That was the key thing. We did just enough architecture, just enough governance that we told the story and then got the buy-in and we had all the right artifacts. We did all the right things, but it was just having those small chunks and, and getting the right people in the room. Um, and solving a problem. And then we went out and solved another problem. Um, so um, in, in summary, and then I will open it up for Shannon for questions. Um, when we talk about governance, it's that orchestration of that people, process, technology, and culture. And those are a lot of things to manage. And that's why data governance can be challenging. When, when you get it right, like this example, it just sometimes seems so easy. You know, I, you know, a month worth of effort, we solved a problem, got everyone bought in. But there's a lot of like a figure skater, right? There's a lot of work to make it look easy. Um, and there's no one size fits all. So, you know, I could have gone in, had that success, and then gone into another big financial institute or healthcare company and tried to do the same thing. And that might not have worked for them, right? You need to listen and do a right size fits all for your solution. But at the same time, no matter who you are, I do think you need some sort of quick win because humans are humans and we get bored um, and we need to see positive reinforcement or we'll go on to something else. Um, again, if, if you enjoyed these webinars, the, they are recorded in the past, and please do join us next month uh, for Data Architects for Digital Transformation. Um, if you are interested in any of this, shameless marketing plug, um, we do this for a living and would be happy to help. And with that, I will open it up to Shannon for questions. Donna, thank you so much, as always, for another fantastic presentation. If you have questions for Donna, you can put them in the Q&A portion of your screen. You can find the Q&A panel in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording for everybody and anything else requested. And Donna, I got to say, I learned another, another, uh, you don't like fax machines, another quirk. I don't like that. <laughs> I do not like fax machines. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so um, diving here, what are some key items that you would recommend that are uh, included in an enterprise data governance policy? Um, key items that are included in a policy. Um, one is getting the definition of what a policy is, what a, what a policy is for one company as a procedure somewhere else and, and getting some examples in your organization. Again, I often come in as a consultant, so this may be obvious to you, um, but get some examples of other policies. I think it, it should be who, who would be impacted by that, um, some very specific you know, actions uh, for that policy and some um, guardrails, uh, even just some simple things of, of when that policy was created, how long it's enforced, um, uh, yeah, those are some things I would think through. I love it. And what are the key points when selecting a tool for monitoring data quality of the whole organization? Ah, uh, got the tool question. Um, do you need a tool for one? Um, 
could you, or maybe start with, with some proofs of concept with some tools? Can you do some simple SQL queries and write your own little dashboard? That might be one. It might be, you know, how much you can see that one of the reasons to do that is kind of a proof of concept of what are your business rules and how complex they are. So often there's a kind of a business rule component. Do they have that? Um, how much you can customize that versus out of the box and, and which one of those is important. You might just say, hey, you know, we've address data. That's a perfect example. Address data. I, I'm sure people have done addresses before. I don't want to think through this at all. Just could you you know, clean my data? Could you even augment data? Do they have third party tools to help augment that? And can I report on it really quickly? And then another aspect of that might be, can you integrate with real time systems? Can you be that, you know, when I said data entry at its core, how do I integrate with that? And you might just want something totally automated, please. I know this can't be rocket science. Other people have done it. And, and some of those aspects that I mentioned, the automation, the customization of business rules, the pushback to systems, the reporting. Uh, but you could say, and we've got clients that do that, actually our customer base is really unique and we have international addresses and um, names that don't conform to the typical uh, naming structures and we want to customize our business rules. So that might be, again, almost your classic example where you might have very different tools. Um, and that or maybe address isn't important to us we do everything with email um now and so i don't even care about address so anyway uh, those would be some of the aspects to look for in a tool and there's some really high-end you know tesla type of tools and, and sometimes you can go really low end so don't don't overspend um also usability uh, we had one customer that got a tool that had everything they needed but they they needed so much training uh, they just didn't uh, use it and so a lot of those tools have come a long way with being much more user-friendly Oh, one more, or could it be part of another tool? Like, so, for example, MDM or Master Data. Sometimes they'll have, to, you know, it doesn't have to be only a pure play data quality solution. It could be integrated into another tool set, a data catalog or a MDM or something. Yeah, you know, there were some add-ons to that question as well. Um, uh, is a data governance framework interchangeable with a data governance strategy with respect to this? And um, another person commented on that same question. You know, we created a data governance module in our enterprise governance risk and compliance tool. It's been very well received because you can view the data from the process business unit model or application perspective. Mm -hmm. Yep, no, that sounds good. Um, and I would say that question strategy framework. Yeah, I think, I mean, I wanna see what's in it. I mean, I think why we say framework or even strategy is, are you looking, before you go and execute anything or define your data stewards or do any of your data cleansing or anything, do you do you have kind of that framework in place or the structure of it? And you know, how do we have the policies and how do we execute them and all that before you, you start running? So whatever you want to call it, I, I, I don't care so much. I think it's kind of what, what you have in it. And that, that's why we kind of have that house thing we look at. At least, at least you have the checks in the box of how we kind of looked at these things. And if yes, you know, call it whatever you wish. So um, I think we have time for at least one more question here. Uh, the many different templates for process data and customer journey mapping are useful, but are there recommendations around which to use for different types of organizations or should multiple templates be used to provide all perspectives? And if so, is there a best order to complete them in? Mm, I'm a big fan of taking the standards and then tweaking them to meet your own purposes. So uh, the BPMN are kind of your swim lanes. I, I, this one, this type of one, I think is really good for manufacturing or if you're very process centric, like actually this I think was some, uh, man, you know, they, they built their product and you do X, you do Y, you do Z in this really clear swim lanes. I think these work really well. This actually is almost classic BPMN, you know, your classic swim lane workflow. Work, this workflow, type, I think it works really well because most people can understand it, even if you don't know that that circle is a start, you know, entity and the, if it's filled in, it's the end, you, you kind of get it. Um, I like, for example, I put a little picture of a person here on mine because that gets to know that those are the swim lanes or a picture of a database versus a, I'll put in a picture of a file or, you know, a spreadsheet of telephone if they're making the call. So I, I tend to kind of spice it up. Um, yeah, but there's, you know, it, again, it de depends um, on your organization, but I think these are often when it is very, you know, when the issue is passing data between groups or is very process centric, I think these work well. Um, someone who does customer journey maps might cringe at this one. This is super high level. There's whole methodologies on customer journey mapping, but I think it could be the same company, right? This could be done by marketing. This could be done by manufacturing. So I, th I think they're, I would see them as separate things. Um, and yeah, it just you, this would be probably looking at more from the 
you know, the stakeholder point of view, like a, a patient or a student or a customer, if that helps. I love it. But that does bring us to the top of the hour here. Donna, again, thank you so much for thank another you. great presentation. Thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do um, and all the great questions and comments. Uh, just to, again, a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, the recording, past webinars, and upcoming webinars for this series as well. Hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Donna. Thank you.